yield curve is definitely telling you a recession is, is coming. It's not here yet, but the check is certainly in the mail. Two tens that inverted, Fed funds tens now inverted with further hikes coming. That tells you a recession probably a lot. Probably uh, the least contested point of the year that there will be a recession in the United States and that it probably will happen next year. Matt Dizak, Merrill and Bank of America Private Bank, head of Chief Investment Office uh, Fixed Income Strategy, joining us yesterday. This is, to me, one of the most interesting points. That everyone seems to be saying there will be a recession. So if everyone agrees on it, will it happen? Joining us now, Jim Bianco. I want to get straight to him because he's got fascinating points. Founder and president of Bianco Research. Jim, let's start there. There's going to be a recession in this next year, is there? Well, it's been more discounted than any time in the 50-year history of the Philadelphia Fed survey. So everybody expects a uh, recession. And because of that, everybody expects the Fed to pivot. They'll be cutting rates in the second half of the year. And everybody expects that what's going to drive that is going to be falling inflation. We all love to whisper to each other, you know, the inflation rate is going to come in much lower in the second half of next year. We all say that. And really what's happened is transitory never went away. So we're going to have a recession. Inflation's going to fall. The Fed's going to pivot. And that's what... We appear to be having some technical difficulties with Jim. We'll try him again and see if we can reestablish that. But what he was saying there was fascinating, that basically there is this stealth transitory that has been taking hold of markets. And perhaps that's part of what's underpinning the belief in rate cuts next year, which is what the market is indicating, despite the Fed's protestations, where they're basically saying, no way, they're not going to cut rates next year because they need to combat inflation uh, where it is right now and bring it back down to 2%. The stealth inflation has been a concern, and we've been talking about it all morning, that the short and shallow, is that the new transitory, right? That, that we're going to basically be able to come out of this quickly because inflation will right-size itself. And one thing that Fed officials keep saying again and again is that, no, it will not. This is different. It has a more persistent feel to it. And that is the reason why we have to hold rates at 5% or more for the entirety of 2023. The market is pushing back because of exactly what Jim Bianco uh, was just saying. They basically Basically, we're just saying, Jim Bianco was just saying uh, that the stealth argument, the stealth transitory argument is still underpinning so much of market action. Since we've been talking, the S&P uh, was up in pre-market trading. It's now basically flat. The euro is uh, up against the dollar. It really has been more of a dollar story than a euro story. That's what a lot of people are saying. 103.51 there. Yields up. Just a touch higher, 371.44, uh, and crude a bit higher as well. Crude also underpinning so much of the story with people saying uh, that that could potentially give more buying power to consumers. That's what Evan Brown was saying of UBS Asset Management, that if you give more buying power to consumers come next year, you could end up with a stronger economy than many people had previously expected because they can keep going out and spending. And we heard again uh, from other people that we do have uh, some sort of uh, the the inflation that we see with respect to uh, the Social Security payments as well that are going to be risen, I believe, more than 8 percent come next year. John, what Jim was just talking about, that stealth inflation, Jonathan Farrow joining us from his other location, uh, really is interesting and probably underpinning what we hear from so many people about rate cuts next year. I thought I'd gone away. You just bring me back in. I can't help myself, John. You know what they think the risk is now? And you hear it from Loretta Mester, and she was speaking a couple be Smith over at the FT yesterday, and it comes down to risk management. And I think we heard it from Chairman Powell in the last news conference. They still believe that the risk of doing too little outweighs the risk of doing too much. And their biggest fear is that they move away prematurely and you have a flip-flopping scenario that Mohammed al Arian warned about earlier this summer that takes us back to the 1970s. And I think you heard that loud and clear from Loretta Mester yesterday in the FT when the Cleveland Fed president said the cost of stopping too early are high. We want to be very diligent about this. With that framework, there is a risk here, Lisa, and some people are extremely worried about this. So this Fed is committed to over-tightening. And some people think they've already gone too far. And we heard that from David Rosenberg about an hour ago. And Jim Bianco was just referencing that, this idea that under their breasts they whisper, it's coming down a lot more, don't worry.
worry about it. And that's what we keep hearing from everyone. John, I will let you go and prep, but, you know, I had to bring you back because, you know, that's what I do. Michael McKee, also here, Chief Economics Correspondent for Bloomberg Television uh, and Radio. And, and Mike, as we hear about this, as we hear about the Fed officials pushing back and we hear about the stealth tightening, do you think that people are starting to say it more loudly and that there are certain Fed officials that are listening that perhaps inflation is rolling over faster than they expected? Well, I think they're all listening and they're all looking and they're all keeping their fingers crossed. The problem is, is you don't know. And it could be a one-time thing or they could be surprised again. And since they were surprised with the uh, transitory that didn't happen, they're going to be much more cautious going forward. But a lot of them have said that uh, there is not only more tightening in the global system than is reflected in the markets, but there is also a good chance that inflation starts to come down in many categories very quickly. The problem is, is uh, of course, the Fed looks at the PCE index as their metric, and the CPI is going to come down more slowly because of the way housing is in that uh, index. And so it's a balancing act, too, between what the public is going to focus on and what the Fed sees sort of behind the scenes. The labor market. We get labor market data tomorrow as well as Jay Powell speaking uh, at, I believe, 1.30 p.m. Uh, tomorrow at the Brookings PM. Institute yes. for uh, for a panel there. We do get the JOLTS data, which I think is going to be really interesting. And then on Friday, uh, we get the jobs report. What are you watching most closely? This is something we've been talking about all morning. I mean, people say Jay Powell speaking, but all of the Fed speak hasn't seemed to matter. And it has been the data in the front seat for the most part. Yeah, it's still the data in the front seat. And I think JOLTS is going to be important in the sense that people want to know our job uh, openings starting to go away because the Fed's focused its whole uh, sort of policy on the idea that the labor market is tight because there are so many job openings. And we've seen it bounce around a little. So does that really uh, start to change? Uh, and then, of course, we get the jobs report and unemployment is what people are going to be watching because the Fed has said it's going to go higher. And a lot of people who make the case that the Fed's going too far say it's going to reflect uh, unemployment is going to reflect a lot of people losing jobs pretty soon. The problem with unemployment is it's a lagging indicator and it takes sometimes several quarters uh, before uh, the uh, unemployment rate really starts to rise. So it may not be a completely reliable predictor this time. And then, of course, I'll throw in that last caveat that I keep doing is this is a very weird time coming out of this pandemic, and there are no models that really tell us what's going to happen. Okay, so then perhaps just weigh in quickly on something that you can give a concrete answer on. If the S&P CoreLogic Case-Shiller 20 City Composite City Home Price Index were to rebrand, what do you think the rebranding should be to have a more kind of digestible name? I still call it Case-Shiller. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we'll go with. Case-Shiller, I mean, the definitive It's been so you. long. Yeah. Yeah. That it's there. I'm sorry to the S&P folks. I know that they want to get their name on there. But. <laughs> All right. The case chiller. Michael McKee, thank you. Rejecting the rebrand and uh, debranding. Coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Ra Radio, Mary Kay Henry, international president of the Services Employees International Union, a fascinating conversation at a moment where there still is this question of whether that agreement that President Biden is urging will get passed through Congress to bring all of the unions to the table. Citigroup's Andrew Hollenhorst raising questions about whether he has enough support for that agreement that includes a 25 percent wage increase over the next five years. In markets, we do see a bit of softening in futures coming off the earlier highs. 39.67. This is Bloomberg.